Welcome everyone to uh, another of One Chance Lane's Back to Basics webinars. Uh, today, Richard Cherry and I are going to be talking about uh, disrepair and dilapidations. Um, uh, so a few pointers to begin with. If you've got a question, please make use of the Q&A. Uh, Richard and I will be monitoring that and we'll try and pick up questions as we go along. Um, and uh, if not, we'll try and try and round things up round things up at the end probably won't manage to give opportunities for participants to speak because um, we've never managed to get the technology working um, but we will try and answer all your Q and A's. Um, Richard and I have both got slides for our presentations um, and those will be emailed to you um, after the webinar um, so uh, you'll be able to, to take to make notes on them so don't worry about uh, not having the slides in future. And then we'll remind you later on that next week um, we will have, James will have a further webinar when one of our colleagues, Sarah Prager, will be talking, discussing um, gastric illness and travel claims in the light of a recent decision of Griffiths and Chewy. And that's the same time, same place as it were um, next week. So those are sort of preliminary marks. I'm now going to try and share my screen um, so that um, you can see um, my slides. Um, so, um, now, let me see if I can actually get the slides flicking along. Okay, so um, these are our, what we're going to be talking about today then. Um, so it, it is a back to basics topic. Um, about disrepair and dilapidations. So you may well find that um, some of the stuff that we're covering is fairly basic and um, hopefully uh, you'll find yourselves nodding along in agreement with what we're saying, um, recognizing the things that we're talking about. But we're, essentially we're gonna break the standards of four topics. I'm gonna be talking about in general terms when a repair obligation is breached, then you're gonna have have a change of speakers and Richard is going to talk about section 11 of the Land on Tenant Act 1985 it's obviously very important for residential uh, leases and then we're going to uh, have two topics about remedies about damages I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the tenant's liability for damages at the end of the lease and then Richard will look at how the landlord's liability for general damages is calculated and then we'll try and round up Q&A um, at the end. Um, so the first point then about the question of repair, um, one point to bear in mind is that repair isn't just about who needs to carry out works. Um, it may come into play in other context situations. You may need to advise about whether a repair obligation is relevant. So for example, um, what the level of service charges are going to be. Uh, can work fall within a service charge or not, depending on whether it's repair or not. Uh, it may have an impact on rent review um, the liability for uh, repairs may impact on that. Um, it may have an impact on whether access can be obtained for certain works and for the landlord it may affect his liability for personal injuries to uh, occupiers or visitors. Um, so what is required by a covenant to repair is going to depend on the ordinary rules by which a courts construe a contract and in the slide you'll see I put a hyperlink which you'll be able to click on which will take you to a YouTube video um, of a previous webinar about the ordinary rules of construction. Um, if you're not interested in how courts construe contracts, how we argue the meaning of the contracts, you might want to click on it just to compare today's haircut of mine, which has been prepared by a family member, and my haircut uh, at the time of that previous talk, uh, when uh, the hairdressers had been closed for a considerable period of time, uh, you might want to compare and contrast, um, or you might not. Um, but essentially what the rule, the rules of the course apply, it's an objective test and you can see the quote from uh, Lord Hoffman um, below. Uh, it's what the part the reasonable parties would have thought the, would have understood the words to mean. So um, there's, there's many different ways that a repair covenant has, will be drafted, but the essence of what we're talking about when we're talking about repair is the idea of a restoration of a physical condition of something that has deteriorated. So you're looking for a change in the physical state of something before repair uh, is necessary arises. 
So that word is then going to exclude having to do works to cure design defects or poor workmanship at the time of construction of the premises. So there's a few examples um, in the, the next slide here. So Quick and Taff Ely Borough Council, um, well-known case to the effect that severe condensation in uh, a dwelling which had been caused by a design defect of the cold bridging from the windows to the rest of the premises um, wasn't a repair that landlord needed to cure. And then commercial example in post office and Aquarius properties where the basement was flooded to ankle depth of water because of the defective kicker joint, not repaired because it was the defective kicker joint which had always been there. And then this principle that uh, you need to be remedying something which has become defective follows through in the case of Southwark LPC, also known as Southwark and Mills. So the landlord doesn't have an obligation to put in sound insulation. And uh, in the Secretary of State for Environment case, the tenant isn't obliged to remove asbestos uh, under a repair covenant. Um, now, just because you've got a design defect doesn't mean to say you're completely outside the scope of the possibility of repair obligation coming into play. Um, it could be, for example, that the inherent defect itself causes damage to other parts of the property. Um, and the classic uh, one, which Richard will touch upon later, may be where um, the condensation causes damage to plaster. Um, the other circumstance where you may uh, be able to rely on repair obligation is if the defective item itself has become damaged um, and then it will need to be repaired um, and uh, the, the defect likely cured as a consequence of a repair at that stage. Now, although this is about repair, we need to contrast repair with a covenant to keep in good condition, which is potentially wider. Um, and just two examples of how that has been considered to be wide of a covenant to keep something in good condition. So the Credit Suisse case, uh, premises, lots of leaking through the cladding and the glazing uh, as a result of construction and design defects. Um, not in disrepair because it was inherent defects, but not in the required condition uh, because the building wasn't watertight. Welsh and Greenwich LBC, um, I've underlined the keywords of the express obligation there. It was an obligation to maintain the dwelling in good condition repair. Uh, that did require the uh, landlord to install insulation to prevent damp uh, because the uh, co express covenant related to the dwelling itself rather than, for example, the structural exterior of the dwelling. Um, what standard of repair is required? Um, were, you'll probably already be aware that a covenant to repair something includes a covenant to put something in repair. So if a tenant takes property which is already in disrepair at the start of a tenancy, um, they've got the obligation to put it in repair. Now that standard of repair can be limited by the contract. So very often you'll see um, the parties will agree a scheduled condition and limit the tenant's repair obligation to that scheduled condition. Uh, you may also see an exclusion uh, for fair wear and tear, I put fair wear and tear, but it should probably be. Um, even if they don't have a limitation in that way, the general covenant doesn't require premises to be in perfect repair, but only substantial repair. And generally what we mean by uh, substantial repair or the standard of repair that the parties responsible for repair obligation needs to achieve is such repair as having regard to the age, character and locality of the premises would make them reasonably fit for the occupation of a reasonably minded tenant of the class who would be likely to take them. Um, so you need to look at the building, you need to look at the type of person who's in, going to be using the building and what standard would they expect the property to be in. So a, a very old building, for example, uh, you would not expect to be in pristine condition, a, more, a new and more modern building you would expect to be in a better condition. Um, the obligation to repair, when does it arise, is often an important question. Not so much in the context of when the tenant has responsibility, more when the context of the landlord has responsibility. Because generally, the landlord will require notice of a defect before the repairing obligation arises in a part which he has demised to the tenant. Now, that can be displaced by contract, but that's the general proposition. So, um, it can be said that the landlord is only in breach where he has information about the existence of the defect, such as would put a reasonable landlord on inquiry as to whether works of repair are needed. 
and uh, he has failed to carry out the necessary works with reasonable expedition thereafter. So the repairing obligation is you, you've got a period of time um, before there is a breach of repairing obligation once the landlord is aware the work needs to be done. Now, this requirement for the landlord to have notice um, was considered in the Supreme Court case of Edwards and uh, Kumar Arasami. And there's three things which um, to draw out of that case. Firstly, this requirement to give the landlord notice is based on an implied term of the lease and therefore can be displaced by the express terms. Uh, you might require the tenant to give notice. Uh, the landlord may expressly say that uh, in relation to something that he um, has within his own um, use, that the, the, the uh, tenant needs to give notice of, of that as well. Um, but the reason for the rule is not only the landlord's inability to know of this repair, but also the tenant's advantageous position. And so that has an impact where you're looking at uh, something outside the scope of the demise premises. Because the implied term depends on the tenant's advantageous position, um, if, a, if a defect is in another part of the building, not within the demise premises, uh, the, this implied requirement of notice isn't going to, to apply. Uh, but it can be displaced by special circumstances and special circumstances in Edward and Kumarasamy were that the landlord only had one flat in a multiple use building and had no property interest in the part which was defective, which was the paving. Um, and that was to, uh, the obligation to require on repair on notice was, was displayed. So, so, so a requirement that he need notice uh, was held to exist there because uh, the landlord had no interest in the part that fell into disrepair. Um, and I think that's probably where I hand over to um, Richard. Um, so I'm going to stop my share and pass on to Richard. Super, thank, thank you, Zach. I'm just saying I've, I've got a question that, that I'll be dealing a little bit with, but um, the question is, what if the tenant gives notice to the landlord verbally and then hinders the landlord in carrying out the repair? Um, certainly in the domestic context, obviously it would be fact specific. Uh, the landlord has a right, uh, generally uh, has a right to enter, to inspect and repair. If they're hindered from doing that, uh, then that will clearly reduce the uh, entitlement to damages in the residential context. I don't know if Zach wants to add anything um, that would be a specifically uh, general yeah. rapidations answer. So, so, so um, generally speaking, the landlord will have a contractual right to enter to go in to do the works. So, and, and there's an implied right in section 11 as well. Um, if a tenant breaches that, the landlord effectively has the counterclaim um, by way of defence that my, the damage has been caused by your own breach of contract and not allowing me access. So, so, so that is how a uh, tenant interfering with landlord carrying out works in, 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 in leases tends to play out. Um, so I'll pass on to Richard to talk more about section 11. Great, well, as, as Zach said, um, this is intended to be bread and butter stuff. Um, hopefully, as, as he said, you'll be nodding along. Uh, it won't be too contentious, but it may be a useful refresher um, for anyone who isn't doing a lot of um, disrepair claims. It's it's the residential property aspect of it that I'm looking at um, and the the starting point is that it is while it's uh, not just a standard claim in contract it is based on contract because a lease or tenancy is just a specialized form of contract so you start with the terms of your contract you work out what's what's actually been breached and then you can consider the damage for it but of course it's never quite that simple because you've got serious um, elements of statutory uh, in input over overlay, if you like, onto the contract. And then there's tortious elements in terms of things like um, PI, uh, nuisance. So it, it's a hybrid claim. Um, the first uh, bit of our statutory overlay is, of course, that Section 11 of the um, 85 Landlord and Tenant Act. Uh, that is a minimum to which a tenant in a, uh, in a tenancy that is uh, under that act is entitled. Uh, by and large, the tenancies are short lets, uh, assured shorthold tenancies, secure tenancies, assured tenancies. Um, it doesn't apply to licenses. 
But of course, it's always the case that the express terms of the tenancy can be more onerous. And if they are more onerous, then they will apply on top. But you've always got your section 11 uh, as a basis. Um, always helpful to plead a covenant for quiet enjoyment if you're framing a claim um, for a tenant and non-derogation from grant in, in the alternative, but it all really comes out much the same. Also important to plead the Defective Premises Act, uh, and I'll be looking at exactly what the impact of that is. That's a slightly different um, operation, which is quite useful in cases where you've got issues about notice being given to the landlord. So the base duty that we probably all know by heart but haven't looked at for ages, because the things that are closest to us become somewhat invisible. There is an implied con covenant by the lessor. A, to keep in repair the structure and exterior of the dwelling house, and that includes drains, gutters and external pipes. B, to keep in repair and proper working order, slightly different and extended wording, installations in the dwelling house for the supply of water, gas, electricity and for sanitation, uh, but not other fixtures, fittings and appliances, water, gas, electricity, which might seem to um, rule out a boiler, but uh, C, to keep in repair and proper working order, the same standard of duty there, the installations in the dwelling house for space heating and heating water. And uh, a duty to keep in repair includes a duty to put in repair. So you can't have a landlord saying, oh, well, it was it was rubbish uh, to start with. If it's not in repair, they must put it in repair. And just um, a, a detail from case law on what structure is, is including the floors, the windows and the walls, including the plaster. And uh, of course, that mentioned, mentioned um, Quick and Taffili, which was fascinating if you're interested in plaster. Um, the interesting point from that was that while condensation damp isn't uh, a Section 11 uh, actionable uh, disrepair, uh, if the plaster then becomes saturated, that plaster is in disrepair. So it, there's a limited, um, there's a limited get out for a landlord, but there's infinite amounts of, uh, of debate. Uh, a landlord will always say that uh, damp is condensation damp, a tenant will always be saying it's from a structural cause, it's penetrating damp, it's rising damp, it's therefore covered by section 11. And your expert hopefully uh, will give some kind of answer, although quite often they say it's a hybrid. Uh, common parts, there are similarities that you'll see and differences from, from Zach's um, presentation. The landlord is, is also uh, obliged to repair the common parts, uh, but not any parts. So if, 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 let's say, a local authority owns a large block, well, obviously they will um, retain almost invariably the common parts. They therefore have the responsibility for that. If it is outside of their uh, ownership or control, so if a, uh, a flat or flats in a building are owned uh, by, by a landlord, but they do not um, own the common parts, then they don't have a responsibility for that. It's, it's um, fairly logical for once. Um, and 1B at the bottom there, nothing in section 1A shall be construed as requiring the lessor to carry out any works or repairs unless the disrepair or failure to maintain is such as to affect the lessee's enjoyment in the dwelling house or any common parts. So again, fairly logically, if, if, it's, a, if it's of no consequence to the tenant, then they can't start shouting about it. Um, Further limitations, what the landlord doesn't have to do is uh, to A, carry out works or repairs for which the lessee is liable by virtue of duty to use the premises in a tenant-like manner, that um, old-fashioned phrase um, has been described as changing, changing a plug, uh, changing a fuse, fixing a slightly dripping tap. Very minor works will be um, down to the tenant and also, they have to use it in a tenant-like manner. They don't have to start mocking it about. Uh, the standard of repair, again, very similar to the um, the citation from, from Zach, the standard of repair uh, regard shall be had to the age, character and prospective life of the dwelling house and the locality in which it's situated. But it's a little bit uh, old fashioned. A court is not going to say, well, you're in North Shields, what do you expect? And um, in case anybody wants to put anything in the chat, I am from North Shields and I love it. Um, the implied covenant for entry in section 11.6 in a lease in which the lessor's repairing covenant is implied by section 11, there is also implied a covenant by the lessee that the lessor or any 
every person authorised by him in writing may at reasonable times of the day, giving 24 hours notice in writing to the occupier, enter the premises comprising the lease for the purpose of viewing their condition and state of repair. So that uh, relates to our question earlier. There is an implied right for the landlord to get in and it's very important, um, I always think, um, when advising a landlord to say get in there, check what there is, because there, there are two elements to that. One is, A, you can see if there is anything that needs to be repaired and you can get on and repair it because a landlord's going to have to repair anyway um, and they can reduce the damages that would be um, owed by doing so in, in good time because you have a reasonable time to repair but if that reasonable time then elapses damages start from the uh, beginning of, of the existence of the disrepair or indeed the notice whichever is um, later and appropriate and if uh, as often happens tenants deny entry um, it will, again, it will weaken the tenant's case. The landlord can't repair what he can't get to. So, um, again, just, just for once, the law is relatively logical. Um, now, uh, we were specifically asked about the Homes Fitness for Human Habitation Act 2018. That's a very short act. You could read the whole of it. Um, it's a couple of sections. And what it does is amend the 85 Act to add nine, section 9 capital A, which I've put on the slide there, in a lease to which this section applies of a dwelling in England, uh, there's also a, um, an issue for Wales, there is implied a covenant by the lessor that the dwelling A is fit for human habitation at the time the lease is granted, or if later at the beginning of the term of the lease, and will remain fit for human habitation during the term of the lease, because there was a very old um, phrase that there's no law against letting a tumble down house. There now is a law against that. Um, so it's been implied into the duties of the landlord in section 11. It also has been very carefully um, with respect to those drafting it, very carefully drafted to dovetail nicely with um, section 11. Again, uh, the limitations on the landlord's liability are very similar. Uh, they don't have to carry out any works or repairs for which the lessee is liable by virtue of one, to a one, the duty of the lessee to use the premises in a like manner, or an express covenant of the lessee of substantially the same effect as that duty. That, however, um, is, is subject to the same limitation on the limitation, if you like, which um, means a landlord can't covenant out of section 11. Um, but any any covenants that are of effect that absolve them will, will obviously apply to that duty. Uh, they don't have to rebuild or reinstate in case of destruction or damage by all the usual uh, nasties. Uh, to keep or in repair or maintain anything which the lessee is entitled to remove from the dwelling, that again mirrors some of the wording of section 11, uh, to put the lessor in any breach of any obligation imposed by an enactment, um, or to uh, carry out works where they haven't got the consent of the superior landlord if they haven't, uh, if they haven't had that, having tried. Um, it's also uh, down at three there, doesn't give them any liability in respect of a lessee's own breach of covenant, naturally, um, and uh, anything that they don't have to uh, make good because of an exclusion or modification under Section 12, which we haven't looked at. But it, it's it's a very similar series of, of exclusions uh, as Section 11. So what's the Defective Premises Act do? It is a statutory duty which can be um, giving, which can give rise to a claim in tort. Um, where premises are let under a tenancy which puts on the landlord an obligation to the tenant for the maintenance or repair of the premises. So again, that would be uh, including those section 11 or tenancies to which section 11 applies. Landlord owes a slightly wider class of persons to whom the duty is owed to all persons who might reasonably be expected to be affected by defects in the state of the premises. So more, um, more unvaried people, defects rather than disrepair in the state of the premises, duty to take such care as is reasonable in all the circumstances, a more um, sort of tortious language, to see that they're reasonably safe from personal injury or from damage to their property caused by a relevant defect. And two, a helpful bit, the said duty is owed if the landlord knows, whether as a result of being notified by the tenant or otherwise, so if they actually have notice, or if he ought in all the circumstances to have known of the relevant defect. So it's not actual notice um, that's, that's essential. Um, and in section 4.4, it specifically fixes a landlord with notice. 
where premises are left under a tenancy, which gives a landlord right to enter the premises to carry out any maintenance or repair, then as from the time when he is first, or by notice or otherwise can put himself in a position to exercise the right, and so long as he is or can put himself in that position, so you see if, if the tenant stopped him, that would, um, that would be an exclusion under 4.4 4 here, um, he will be treated just for the purposes of subsections 1 to 3 above, as if he were under an obligation to the tenant for that description of maintenance or repair of the premises. Um, and again, not liable for any defect arising from or continuing because of a failure to carry out an obligation expressly imposed on the tenant by the tenancy. So the, the three bits or two because of because the um, fitness for human habitation just, in, uh, just adds a clause into the 85 Act. DPA and the 85 Act working together in slightly different ways. It's not about notice, it's about reasonable foreseeability because of the, um, the tortious nature. So when you're looking at damage, what, what is actually in disrepair? Um, how long has it, has it persisted and when was there notice, whether actual or implied, if they require notice? And then, uh, odd, slightly oddly for a contractual case, what has been the impact on the tenant? The damages will vary with your, with your tenant. The big, big ticket items are going to be damp. It's always, as I say, the fight between is it penetrating, was it structural related, or is it condensation? Hopefully the expert will tell you something helpful about that. Heating and hot water. Um, obviously, a complete absence of heating and hot water is going to be much more serious than in summer, and that will be reflected in damages. Equally, um, a vulnerable tenant uh, may be much more affected by that, in terms of children, etc. So your, your victim in tortious terms uh, will determine the damage, even though it's largely contractual. Uh, any dangerous or unfit installations, any infestations, infestations can sometimes be a bit of a, um, a source of um, source of a fight. Uh, are they arising from disrepair? Would the infestation in itself then cause disrepair? You're back to quick and tafili. So there can be some infestations that, that will be argued and not down to section 11. Um, how is it evidenced? Well, the tenant's own evidence, uh, anecdotal, any photos, obviously they're all got mobile phones these days, everybody can take photos on their mobile phones, it's very helpful. Sometimes videos, I had a video of cockroaches running around, which was really horrific and, you know, a court is going to take that very seriously. Any contact with third parties, other tenants in the block, for instance, particularly if there are communal uh, items like a communal heating boiler, as there still are in many local authority or ex-local authority blocks. Um, even the communal water tank, um, I've had a case where there have been bits of something or other uh, in the water tank. And the fact that all the other tenants were complaining about it is obviously very strong evidence that it's, it's a real issue. Uh, your expert report will give you lots of evidence. That's, of course, a snapshot and the housing file uh, in, in any public sector tenancies, whether LA or uh, Housing Association. So how do we know how long it's persisted? Because, of course, all we've got is, is today's evidence. Well, has the tenant complained in the past? Uh, have they themselves contacted builders as opposed to the landlord's contractors? Have they been to the doctors saying, um, my child has got a wheezy chest because they're living in a damp house? Um, that will be relevant evidence that there may have been a problem uh, in advance of, of the date where they're actually able to put their witness evidence down in a statement. Have they replaced items? Um, have, have bits of bedding been ruined by mould? Uh, have they got receipts for that? Again, photos on their phone. What have they noticed and how long, how long for? Um, limitation, the limitation period is six years. Uh, the fact that most um, disrepair claims will in fact be disrepair counterclaims because um, for many, many reasons, a tenant will not always have the means or it can even the motivation, even in quite serious cases of disrepair, to bring a claim themselves. And it's almost invariably when a landlord brings a claim for uh, possession on the basis of rent arrears, suddenly out of nowhere, a, um, a disrepair counterclaim will arise. Now, that's not to say that it's not genuine, some are, some aren't, but um, the fact is that they don't get uh, brought almost uh, of themselves. Um, the limitation period would be six years from the date of the claim for a counterclaim, so that's even a bit longer. And when you think that, particularly in today's atmosphere, that it can take a couple of years for to get through the courts. That's that's an awful lot of years that you can be um, you can be paying out in, in damages if you're a landlord. All the more reason to get in there quickly, inspect it, and, and to carry out repairs. 
The housing file, um, I've never seen a housing file that seems to be complete, but there will be um, logs on there of calls from the, uh, from the tenant, of instructing contractors, of housing officers visiting for various reasons, um, maybe an initial tenancy visit. Um, that can all give you notice and it can also evidence the fact that there was disrepair at a certain time. Um, the expert evidence itself can assist on the history. Obviously, it's just a snapshot, an expert report on a particular day, but there may be stains on the ceiling from a leak that's been repaired some years ago. So you can you can use those to evidence the, the history. Um, what do you expect in your expert report? Well, um, obviously, the results of the inspection on that day. If there's damp cases, they should be giving a, a some numerical value on the damp um, percentage wood moisture equivalent and they will contextualize that if, if, um, if they're a serious expert uh, and you will find if you don't already know that there are very few experts who still work at legal aid rates so in any um, legal aid cases you get the same experts coming along and they're, they're pretty good they know what they're doing uh, they'll also report comments from the tenant well they'll be taken um, potentially with a pinch of salt by the by the court but they're there as evidence and um, any good expert will give you a scotch schedule where they will say room by room or the, the exterior item of disrepair is it within section 11 what will it um, what will it cost to uh, to remedy you may have um, rather than a single joint expert you may have uh, two experts and then what would normally be ordered and if, if the court isn't ordering it of its own motion I'd say it's a good direction to ask is that the experts do a joint Scott schedule where they each give a view, they set out where they agree and they and when they where they disagree, they each set out their views and their reasons for disagreement. Um, I, I may have said this before, for a landlord, exercise your right to inspect. Um, and once the tenant and expert evidence and the housing file are all available, is it time to start making offers? He questions. No, I say that's far too late. Um, make offers like in most cases, make offers early and make them frequently. Why not? Um, for a landlord, you need to get your client out of this as quickly as possible. There will be some disrepair, there almost invariably is. Um, get an offer in there and uh, get yourself the protection. If you can make a Part 36 offer, so much the better. But you can just make a, uh, an offer without prejudice, saves the cost. Notice, um, that's often a bugbear. Uh, how can we give actual notice? The tenant can have contacted their housing officer uh, by phone, by uh, email etc um, often we don't have any direct evidence of that and you get the pleading um, on occasions too numerous to particularize but at least since about a million years ago the tenant has been calling the um, the helpline um, well that's uh, taken with a pinch of salt and that that'll be a matter for evidence at trial uh, but if there have been lots of visitors visits from um, landlord servants or agents like their builders um, and the disrepair still uh, prevails, there's some evidence there that the landlord has had notice. You can have notice by um, having any of your servants or agents in the building. They needn't be there to look at the disrepair. They needn't be told by the tenant on that visit, oh, it's damp. If it's something that would reasonably be noticeable, then um, the landlord will be fixed with notice by that. It can be if it's, if it's um, properly pleaded and alleged. Constructive notice, the landlord is deemed to know what's going on about the exterior or the structure. As we said, the parts of the building under the landlord's control that aren't within the tenant's demise, the common parts, etc., and anywhere that they have the duty or the right to inspect. The um, DPA will also fix um, the landlord with notice where they have that um, right to inspect. So you don't need uh, that notice for the effects of any defects, but obviously it's still, you still need some form of notice for section 11. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's about reasonable foreseeability under the tortious heads. Um, the quantum of damages, uh, general damages will be for loss of enjoyment of the home. Uh, it can include stress and suffering caused by the condition of the property, people worrying about their children's health, all, all the sort of things that would arise from not having a, a home that's in proper condition. Uh, injury, personal injury to tenant or family, and as I said, the, the nature of the tenant, their personal factors, their vulnerability often will affect the, the level of damages. Special damages, I'm not going to go through when we do our um, quantification, but they're, as in, in any case, 
it can be damaged to belongings. Um, get a good schedule that evidence is purchased if possible. Value. They won't have um, receipts for everything. Some things will be said to be gifts, but the, the more specifically um, it can be put in a schedule, the, the, the easier it is. And of course, um, the court will not give full value for everything. Everything will be uh, reduced for betterment for, for evidencing. And, and if I'm honest, I think the courts wish to cut the baby in half sometimes. They'll, it's, it's very, very rare that you get your full, your full claim. Um, any extra costs, extra heating bills, uh, if, if people, even if they've been supplied with a space heater by the landlord, there may have been a, um, more power required to heat that. It's maybe less effective than a, um, a built-in central heating system. Any equipment they bought, sometimes um, people say with the lack of a kitchen, uh, they've had to have takeaways or they've had to have ready meals that they've just microwaved. All of that can be claimed for. Um, it, it'll all come out in the wash in special damages, but it, it shouldn't be avoided. Medicines, uh, treatments for bed bugs, all kinds of things like that. Anything, anything that's been um, caused in a, as expenditure because of the disrepair. Um, I will deal with quantification in a second bit, but I'm going to hand back to Zach now. Any questions I'm going to be able to answer through the um, through the mechanism of the chat and um, Zach's away, I think. Well, Richard, we've got a, we've got a question which I think we want to pick up now. Um, so, <laughs> something I avoid it. so, so, so Simon Evans has asked: um, Some landlords have a policy of doing repairs, but not thereafter redecorating. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, the tenant can apply for a decoration allowance. Uh, can a tenant claim this is continuing disrepair, and/or uh, the landlord does the redecoration? Do you want, do you want to have first crack at that? Um, that's a good question. I haven't I haven't had a specific um case of the landlord saying right you can have a redecoration grant uh, and the tenant then fails to redecorate i i would suspect that um well it's gonna it's gonna be fact specific um if if a landlord simply says oh well you can have a redecoration grant and it goes no further it may not discharge the duty to to complete the repairs because because really obviously as, as a question um, presupposes is part of the duty once um, the disrepair has been remedied. Um, if it if it went further down the line, uh, particularly if the tenant had had the grant and then not used it, I would say that would um, absolve the landlord from um, from responsibility for any damages for failure to repair. It's a good question. I I, I haven't come across it. I, I think the court would deal with it in a in a fairly sort of logical on the ground sort of way. And my, my, my thought, Richard, is that it's really about mitigation because, generally speaking, the decorative finishes aren't going to be something that the landlord has agreed to keep in good condition. Usually that's the tenant's responsibility. So if you've got some disrepair which has caused damage to the finishes um, or the landlord uh, has caused damage to the finishes in doing the works which he's required to do, obviously part of the remedying of the situation uh, the landlord's got to remedy the decorative finishes either because his yes. disrepairs caused the decorative finish to be ruined or because his own works have ruined the decorative finish. So if he makes available to the tenant a mechanism for the tenant to get the decorative finishes sorted out, um, it, it seems to me the argument that the landlord would have um, would be you've got to mitigate um, the difficulty by, by, by doing that. Um, but he might not be primarily in breach of the, of an obligation to put the decorative finishes in repair. It would be a consequence of something else, either him doing the works in a certain way which caused damage or uh, the damage being occasioned by the dampness or whatever it is originally. Yeah, that, I mean, that said, the, the, rep the um, redecoration that, that is required as a result of either of those two factors, uh, it, it would be treated in exactly the same way as... Uh, as any other element of disrepair. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose you would look at it as mitigation, wouldn't you? Uh, if, if it's a classic little old lady or um, person with disabilities who's uh, uh, clearly going to be unable, even if they're given a the grant, they're going to have difficulties um, repairing, well then the court will, uh, will have less sympathy with the landlord. And so look, you've got a, you know, you've got a duty to um, come up with some effective scheme that would actually do it. On the other hand, they may say, well, um, the person is able, given the amount of the uh, repair grant they could uh, they could get a contractor and it would, the amount would be sufficient to to get a 
um, to get a painter in to, to do it. Yeah, and it seems to me that goes back slightly to the first question we had about um, tenant um, hindering the landlord carrying out works, because it seems to me that uh, the, the section 11.6 doesn't actually deal with the license to go in to do the works just to inspect. But generally speaking, um, you will get the implied license to do the works you covenant to do, but it's a license which is subject to you making good the damage you do. So mm -hmm. that, that issue carry, follows through in this, the question we've had about decorative effects. Um, I'm going to push on with... Um, There's just one further one that might yeah. be of interest to everyone. If a tenant receives a section 21 notice to leave, I'm just, I'm, this is just, I'm just reading this having first, having seen it right now. However, yeah, I was going to say, do, do, you, do you want to do, pick it up at the end or do you want to do okay, it? Okay, yeah, I'll do, I'll do that. Okay, right, then I shall um, share my screen again. Um, ah, we need, Richard, Richard, you need to uh, stop sharing your screen to begin with. Thank you. Uh, right, um, and then and then right. So hopefully you can see the slides. Right. So um, damages then um, at common law. So the, the, the common law measure of damages for uh, tenants failure to deliver premises up at the expiry of the term. Um, as you can see uh, from the quote there, essentially the cost of repairs that the tenant should have carried out, plus the loss of rent during the period needed to carry out those works of the consequential loss um, of the period that the landlord isn't able to let the property for. Um, it's a bit broader than that because there's other consequential losses that might be recoverable. So the failure to recoup maintenance under a service charge, failure to recoup insurance under an insurance rent, and landlord's potential liability for rents of an empty property. So that's damage for common law. Um, now the problem with uh, the damage for common law is that it can work unfairly. Um, so supposing you have a situation that um, the premises have been left in a state of disrepair, but what the landlord proposes to do is simply demolish them and redevelop. Um, should the landlord be able to get uh, both the cost of repair, which he doesn't carry out, and be able to knock the building down and redevelop it? Um, that was the unfairness which Section 18 of the Landlord and Tenant Act was um, brought in to do. And um, I haven't set it out because it's a 1927 statute and is worded quite uh, prolixly, um, and, uh, but effectively uh, it limits the landlord's damage to the diminution in the reversion um, caused by the tenant's failure to carry out the work. So that is a valuation exercise which requires two valuations to be carried out. The first valuation you need to carry out is what would the property be worth, what would the landlord's interest in the property be worth on the open market if the tenant had complied with the covenants and the lease, the repairing covenants and the lease. And then the second valuation, you need uh, a valuation of what is the value of reversion in the actual condition that the tenant has left it in. To carry out that first valuation exercise, you're going to need to establish uh, those works that the tenant should have carried out. So very often cases about what the diminution value would be also have uh, arguments about uh, whether something was a repair which was required by the tenant to do and what sort of repair should have been done and how much that would have cost and what sort of condition the property would have been left in. So some of those questions that um, we discussed in the first part um, of today's talk. The, then the difference between those two valuations uh, is the diminution in the reversionary value and that then is the cap on the common law damages that the landlord can recover. So section 18 operates um, as a cap on what the landlord can recover. Um, valuations are going to depend on identifying what a hypothetical purchaser would plan to do with the premises and therefore what it would offer for the premises. So would the hypothetical purchaser simply do the works and relet? Would they carry out some refurbishment, some modification and then relet? Would they demolish? Uh, would they perhaps uh, let on short term, having done some minor works before uh, taking a view as to some future development? 
all those schemes, the value has to think about what the purchaser would propose to do. But we don't ignore reality completely. And the, the classic case where um, we have a little bit of a look at reality uh, is where the landlord has actually carried out the work um, which uh, he claims um, the, the, the tenant should have done. So, so where the landlord has actually carried out works, this is treated as prima facie evidence of the damage to reversion. So very often uh, you will see uh, Section 18 valuations where the valuer says, well, in this particular situation, uh, the landlord would do the works uh, and it would take him so many months to do the works and therefore uh, the diminishing in value is exactly the same um, as the common law measure, i.e. it's the cost of the works plus the consequential losses whilst those works are undertaken. Um, and the court can look at whether the landlord has actually carried out the work, um, it's treated as prima facie evidence or a good guide to what the hypothetical purchaser would do. And it's really the burden then falls on the tenant uh, to put some reason forward why this isn't uh, damage to reversion. Similarly, if a landlord hasn't carried out the work, uh, that may be evidence that the work is not necessary uh, and therefore isn't work which uh, is required to be carried out uh, to prevent diminution in reversionary value of the landlord's interest. Um, very often though, the landlord may have an explanation as to why the work hasn't been carried out. Uh, for example, we may not have the funds uh, because the tenants left the property in a particular state. Uh, the landlord may have an explanation why work hadn't been carried out at that point. Um, so if you need to have a look at the valuation methodology, um, Rick's uh, publication, Dilapidations in England and Wales, in chapter 10, has very good uh, methodology set out, describes what steps of value should be taking. Um, and the section 18 valuation may be provided um, under the pre-action protocol, the dilapidations protocol. Um, the onus on raising the section 18 point in the dilapidations protocol is on the defendant, is on the tenant. So paragraph 9.5 is a reference to that. Uh, so the landlord might provide a section 18 valuation, but if a tenant intends to rely on section 18, they are expected uh, to raise the point in pre-action protocol. Um, so I'm going to conclude with a little example from um, the Hamsmatch Properties case of about how Section 18 works in practice. So the premises in that case concern a 1930s purpose-built manufacturing facility, which consisted of factory premises, a warehouse and some offices. And the court, after resolving various issues between the parties, concluded that uh, the cost of the works the tenant should have carried out would have been £2.4 million. Um, and that would have enabled the tenant um, to carry out lettings of the property and the value in repair would have been £3.0 million. And the value out of repair was £2.1 million. Um, and that was essentially the site value uh, on the basis that the hypothetical owner of a version would demolish it and redevelop it for further um, modern commercial use. So the section 18 cap then is the difference between the value and the condition the tenant should have left it, which is 3 million and its uh, actual value 2.1 million. So the section 18 cap is 900,000, substantially less than the cost of the tenant's works. And I think that is my last slide. Uh, so there's Richard and my emails addresses. That's the end of um, my part of the talk. So I'm going to hand back over to Richard um, and stop sharing. Um, and uh, if anyone's got any questions and answers, please do type them away and we'll, we'll pick them up um, after Richard's um, dealt with quantification um, of general damages, which um, one of our members of Chambers has asked for the science behind the art of putting your finger in the air, Richard. Yes, it's going to be so scientific. Just, just, but just to build attention, I'm going to deal with a question from Luke McGowan. Thank you, Luke. That was the one that I was beginning to read out. Um, if a tenant leaves, having um, received a Section 21 notice, but with outstanding repairs, which they didn't contest because they realised the condition was too bad, it was affecting their child's health, etc. Um, and then the building is subjected to uh, a works order by the local authority, which has been completed, can the tenant still pursue if the uh, claim is within limitation? 
And the, uh, the very short answer to that is yes. Um, the right to bring a claim for uh, damages for disrepair doesn't end with the end of occupation. Um, and if the disrepair was so bad that it actually forced the tenant to leave, it can found a claim in unlawful eviction. Um, if the uh, repairs have been completed, obviously it may make evidencing the disrepair harder, uh, but the landlord could be required to disclose the nature and extent of the works performed. So um, whatever the, uh, if there was a detailed work spec from their builders, what they dealt with, that would possibly say what was, what was wrong. Um, and you could also get evidence from the local authority uh, of those matters that caused them to um, require the works to be done. Obviously, an expert report will potentially uh, be less helpful because the, the current snapshot that that gives you of the building is, is not uh, what it was when it was being occupied. Um, so I hope that is at least some form of answer to that question. I'm going to start sharing again. Um, Right, so we were um, looking at damages. I'm now going to do my exceptionally scientific um, quantification. Uh, sorry, I just want to run it through as a, as a slide share. Excuse me. It's always the technology that kills us, isn't it? Right. <clears throat> uh, so having said that it's scientific, it's not. Um, I can't pretend that it is. The two key cases that um, have been taken um, as the basis of quantification of residential disrepair damages are Wallace and Manchester, uh, where they made the base point that the sum is that which is required to compensate the tenant for, distress, for the distress and inconvenience experienced because of the landlord's failure to perform his obligation to repair. Um, and what Wallace and Manchester did was come up with um, amounts fixed not fixed amount, but, but um, amounts expressed in figures of pounds, which then became known as an unofficial tariff, um, which is fine, except that it isn't really a tariff and it wasn't unofficial because it started getting used all the time. Um, English Churches and Shine, which is a very long but very entertaining case for anyone who hasn't read it or hasn't been back to it recently, because Mr. Shine is a, a very interesting individual who seemed to demolish parts of the property in which he resided. Um, and a very, very interesting bit of judging, which came in for some criticism. Uh, that approved Wallace and, and Manchester and that um, a court could order a notional reduction in rent, a global award for discomfort and inconvenience, or a mixture of the two. Well, great, thank you. That's, <laughs> that gives the courts a lot of leeway, but gives um, those using the courts less certainty. But what, certainly what I've found to happen is that um, district judges certainly are willing to work on a percentage basis of the rent. Uh, and while that is no more or less scientific than numbers of pounds for certain things, um, it, it does seem to find favour with the judges that I've been in front of. And it, it does have at least the uh, benefit that you are putting forward a reasoning if you're a, a tenant representative, a reasoning for what the um, damages should be. And also, of course, because Wallace and Manchester was in 1998, um, you don't need to worry about uh, bumping anything up for inflation, because if your rent is higher, then your damage is potentially higher when they're calculated as a percentage thereof. Um, landlords are probably keener on Wallace and Manchester because whenever, almost invariably, whenever sums are ordered rather than percentages, the, the final figure comes out lower. Um, in terms of longer, longer let, this is just in, in short tenancies, Earl and Carolambus 
looks at the proportion of the market value that you've lost as a result of the disrepair. Um, and however, the general damages are quantified because there's an element of PSLA in there, you can apply a Simpson Castle uplift of 10%, which gets quite hefty. Um, so let me give you a possible worked example, which I, I say without any liability, it, it may be absolute nonsense, but it, it's, it's what I do when I'm in front of a judge. Um, we have a monthly rent, thousand pounds for a two bedroom flat. The disrepair comprises thing one, total loss of heating and hot water, December to May through the winter months. After that, six months of patchy heating, the boiler's not, not working particularly well, the radiators aren't heating up, there's a loss of hot water from time to time. There's damp affecting one bedroom severely so that the tenant says that it's completely unusable for the period. The second bedroom has, it's usable but it's not very nice. Um, and the living room has some minor damp. Um, the expert says it's, it's there but it's, it's not massive, um, but it, it will have a, a slight impact on the use. As to the duration, it's uncertain, but it's about a year that we're looking at, just for, for round figures. And there've been some drafts from a defective front door for about two years. So um, in terms of total loss of heating and hot water, in winter months, um, I, for a, for a tenant, would be punting that at 75 to 100% of the rent. If it's the coldest winter in 50 years, so much the worse, you know, it's, it, it's gonna be a high number. You, you invariably, whether you're representing a tenant or a landlord, you invariably don't get all of you all you ask for from a judge, and the landlord may be saying, "Well, it, you know, it, it, it was through the winter months, but there, there were perfectly adequate ways of, of sorting the situation. Yes, it was cold; it could have got some heating and got to mitigate your loss, and those are all very relevant points. But it's total loss of heating and hot water is going to come out at a high number, whichever judge you have, I think." Two, patchy heating for six months thereafter. Well, it's the summer, 25 to 30% is probably a, it's probably a bit high. Um, you might, if it's the summer and if there's not too much a loss of hot water, maybe down to 10%. It's all fact specific, but at least it helps the court to put a number on it, whichever side you're on of the, um, of the fight. The damp, total loss of one room. Well, you're losing one bedroom in two bedroom flat. Um, maybe 40% of the, the use of your whole property. Again, maybe that's high, maybe these are tenant figures. Second bedroom, moderate, less comfortable usage of it, half that, 20%, let's say. Living room, minor discomfort, maybe 10%. It always seems to come out that the smaller elements are come out at 10%. I don't know whether judges just think, well, about 10% will do. Um, so that's all for one year. Four, Drafts from a defective front door, again, maybe 10%, maybe 5%, maybe nothing, um, as we'll see in the next slide. So how do those come out as numbers? Well, um, if it's 75% of your rent for um, six months, that's four and a half thousand pounds, top there. Patchy heating, well, at 25%, as I say, is it, it's a, probably a bit high, but let's just start with that. 25% for six months, that's another six by 250, that's another 1500. Um, if you add up, and this is a big if, if you add up 40% for the one bedroom, 20% for the second bedroom, and 10% for the living room, uh, that gives you 70%. I don't think a court, and I think if I were sitting on it, which I don't, uh, I would be loath to order 70% because those things put together don't, to me, equate to the loss of 70% of the value of the property. So when you get multiple heads, it's, it's, it's a possibly a little like if anybody does um, PI, um, it's the fact that if you've got three injuries, you don't simply go to your tables and add up the, the amounts for all of them, you make an allowance. So in theory, if you did go for 70%, 12 months, that would be 8,400 pounds. For drafts from a defective front door for two years, 10%, I would say a court may not look at that very highly. They may. Um, go to a sort of a more Wallace approach on that and say, well, how about a hundred pounds? They might just give you a figure. And remember, the court can do what it likes. It can go percentage of, of rent, it can go unofficial tariff, it can go a combination of the two. But what it needs to do is perform a cross-check. And while the case law doesn't tell us what the, the cross-check has to do, it has to be somewhere in line with the actual rent. 
Now, of course, um, the case at the bottom there, Kyrgyz and Damani, says that in a, um, an exception, well, no, not exception, exception is never a good word, um, in a case where the landlord's behavior and or the impact on the tenant uh, is sufficiently extreme, has the landlord refused to uh, remedy disrepair for a long period when they know fine well that it's very serious? Um, have they quite happily uh, let it sit there because they know that the tenant is um, old or uh, is finding it difficult to complain? Is the tenant um, a person with a disability? Are they vulnerable? Uh, do they have young children? Um, anything that makes it a very serious case can um, push that beyond 100% of rent by, by Kyoto and Demani. Um, I haven't had a case where I have either had 100% awarded for or against my client, but it, it, it's, it's always worth, for a tenant um, rep, it's always worth putting it in there so the court is reminded that they can go beyond, beyond the full amount of rent. So that red figure, 14,400, the disrepair that's persisting for 12 months, well, the annual rent is only 12,000 pounds. So the cross check would almost certainly result in reducing it. Um, a very, very simple and over simple, I accept, way of looking at it is if you've bought a bag of 10 apples and four of them are off, how much have you lost? Well, you've lost 40%. So how much of the loss of enjoyment of your property have you suffered? It's always a very um, finger in the air sort of figure and different judges take very different approaches but you might say well you've lost almost the whole of the fruits of, of your bargain through those winter months so you might say I'll give you 100% for, for six months of it so you, you get six thousand and then maybe 50% for the rest or so you you get somewhere about what three quarters of your rent then uh, of course you you ask for the 10 percent with simmons and castle and um it's also can be subject to interest that is one very very subjective and i can't stress that um highly enough it's not scientific but that's one method of looking at it you can use that kind of method when you're thinking about what kind of offer to make either um as a landlord or as a tenant representative and i think um that judges welcome having some form of framework because if you think that you're going to be getting to the end of a generally a one-day fast-track trial and it's 4 30 and the judge wants to send the court staff home and, and they've heard a lot of evidence if we can make it easier for them then um it, it's possibly more likely that they'll come out uh our way at the very least um we, we make the judge's life slightly easier and, and that's never a bad thing given, given what district judges have to put up with. Um, so that's what I want to um, offer you for what it's worth. Um, use it, throw it away, but it, it's one way of doing it. Um, I'll just quickly uh, re-plug next week, which will be much cleverer than what I've done. Um, it's Sarah Prager with Jatinda Paul from Owen Mitchell, um, a solicitor barrister combo working in perfect harmony those gastric illness claims um, about a case that I'm sure was fantastic, Griffiths and Chewy. Um, and uh, if you have no idea what that's about, like me, well, why not join them at 11 o'clock next week? Um, that's me done, other than to say thank you, everybody, for bearing, bearing with both of us through this. And I hope it's been of some use or interest. Any questions, yes, put them in the chat now. Um, email us by all means, um, and we will try to help. I don't know if Zach wants to add anything to that. No, I'm just going to add a couple of things about your point about um, Earl and Carol Ambus, um, because the, that exercise that you carried out, um, it, it's not limited to the sort of social housing example that, that, that you've given. But I mean, Earl and Carol Ambus is, is a long lease case. Um, and so it doesn't matter that the tenant's only paying a, a peppercorn rent or a pound a year for his um, property. It's the loss of amenity value to him as if he had let it. So... It, it can apply, so, you know, so you can have some very plush accommodation, um, which are not paying a, a rack rent, a market rent, um, on, on a sort of weekly periodic basis, and, and, and rack up a very substantial claim and general damages based on loss of amenity, using exactly the same method that, that you've outlined there. And 
that, that you can also use that where you've got office premises because if you've got sort of leaky roof or air conditioning which doesn't work um, that has an effect on the employees has an effect on the staff so um, there's no reason why a company shouldn't pitch a claim for general damages in the same sort of way uh, where the landlord is responsible for some services which aren't being provided so th that, that methodology you've said which I think, I think is, is really is a really useful one for people to bear in mind um, but we don't have any further questions so unless someone types very very quickly and and put something to us um, I think that's I think that's all from us for today but did you want to add anything before we say goodbye no other than that I've clearly stunned the audience into silence either by um brilliance or complete tedium but thank you very much everybody um it's it's great to have people along it really is yeah well thank, thank you very much for joining us and um, i'm gonna conclude the uh, webinar now and um you should get our slides emailed to you fairly shortly so so thank you very much everybody okay goodbye